So this audio lecture is going to cover innate immunity, and in our textbook it's covered through chapter 2 and chapter 3. The textbook organizes it a little bit different than how I would if I wrote the textbook. So this next slide is meant to help guide you on where the information is. So there is overview information on innate system both in chapter 2 and chapter 3. So in both chapters, um, there is mention of either the physical, mechanical barriers, chemical barriers, and cellular responses. Um, in cellular responses, that includes phagocytosis, inflammation, um, and these different cellular processes. In chapter three, they talk about receptors of innate cells and also cytokines, chemokines, and some of the markers that we would see in innate cells. In split between ch chapter two and chapter three, um, there's complement, and that's a separate PowerPoint, a separate audio lecture. So we'll talk about complement um, again in a different audio lecture. So um, this is a figure from the textbook sh um, showing you kind of an overview of innate system, including adaptive also at the bottom. So starting at the top, you can see that there's immediate responses from the innate system. So if there's exposure to a pathogen or foreign material, um, you start, your innate system starts to respond right away. So the pathogen can get recognized by effector cells or tissue resident um, effector cells. So these would be innate cells that are found in different tissues or in circulation. So for example, mast cells are found in the skin, in the respiratory tract, um, and in the GI. And so if there was a pathogen or allergen <laughs> present in those locations, the mast cells would start to respond immediately. And that's where you can see sometimes with like an allergic reaction, an immediate hive forming or an immediate um, response from exposure to allergen. Um, similarly with pathogen, if the pathogen is present, um, you can have response by different effector cells in an attempt to kind of control that pathogen. So it's possible that just that initial response is gonna be enough to eliminate the pathogen and really any infection, even though this would be a subclinical infection, wouldn't actually persist. Um, and so any kind of damage to the tissue would be repaired. Now, if these initial steps, um, responses, do not control the pathogen, if it's not eliminated, then we go into this induced innate immune response. So this. Um, occurs between four hours to four days. And this is where we have kind of an activation of the resident cells, also recruitment in of additional ones. So this is, this is where we see inflammation. And so inflammation is gonna recruit in other cells to help the residents, the ones that are present wherever this infection is. Um, we might present with symptoms like a fever because if we increase the body temperature, that starts to move outside of the normal kind of um, temperature zone of some of the enzymes that the pathogen might have or the ideal temperature of the pathogen, okay? And we can enter into acute phase response. So we see changes of um, different markers, different um, cytokine and chemokine levels um, could be detected in um, blood samples of the individual. Now, it's possible that these um, additional recruitments would be able to control the pathogen. And in that case, the pathogen's eliminated and again, infection ends. Now with this level, with this time frame, you're gonna show with some symptoms of an infection. And so this no longer is a subclinical infection, it would be an active infection. But again, even at this point, um, it's possible that your innate system could deal with it, quote unquote. Um, there might be some tissue damage, but then that could be repaired. Now, if the pathogen's not eliminated, this is where adaptive comes in. Um, so the adaptive response for a first exposure um, generally starts to kick in around day four. Um, and this is where recruitment of T cells and B cells, um, antibody, B cells end up producing antibodies that are specific to the pathogen are meant to help clear that out. So you'll see, and this is what we'll talk about later on in the semester. <laughs> so don't focus so much about this line, um, this um, row for our exam, our next exam, um, but just be aware that T cells and B cells will proliferate in response to their antigen being present. 
um, and then they can recruit additional cells and help other cells um, perform their function. And in that case, um, you know, hopefully the pathogen has been eliminated. If it hasn't been eliminated, um, this is where it could cause a chronic infection, it could cause damage to the tissue, where that could impair the function of the tissue. And if we're talking about, you know, a you know, specific organ, depending upon what organ that is, um, that may be critical to the patient. So looking at innate um, immunity, um, it, we can talk about these like three lines or three lines of defense like we did in our first unit. And with innate immunity, um, two lines of defense are entailed. So the first line of defense kind of is a catch-all <laughs> and it includes mechanical, what we also refer to as physical barriers. So this is the anatomy of how tissues are set up. And so you can see on this table how it looks at different um, tissue types like skin, gut, and lungs, and um, in the nose, eyes, oral cavity, so mucosal, mucosal um, cavities, and looking at what are the structures? What's the anatomy of those? So there's epithelial cells that have tight junctions. So if you've taken cell bio, you know about tight junctions. If you're in cell bio, you'll learn about tight junctions. But these allow epithelial cells to be kind of joined together. Um, so it kind of it creates an outside versus an inside barrier. So that mechanical setup kind of prevents pathogens, um, antigens from entering into the tissue. Um, also, when we look at other aspects, such as like um, cilia that moves mucus, like in the lung, also like tears. So these other kind of, again, anatomy properties of these different structures, that would be mechanical. And again, first line of defense. Also in first line of defense is chemical. And so if we look at these different tissues, they have chemical properties. So again, anatomy physiology would have like had to know these different properties. So things like the surfactants that your lung produces um, or the antimicrobial peptides that are in your skin but are also found in all these other um, organ systems. When you look at the gut, there's a low pH, so that automatically eliminates a lot of pathogens from being able to survive that. There's enzymes that are produced in your tears and saliva. So again, all those chemically control the amount of pathogens that could be that could survive in that environment. And then what I really like, one of the things I like about this textbook is that they've included microbial in here. So part of the first line of defense, we also have our normal microbiota, the bacteria that we normally have on our skin, in our gut, in our lungs, in our mucosal um, surfaces that prevent attachment of pathogens. Um, and pathogens really to be good, quote unquote, good at their job, they need to be able to attach to the host. Um, and so your normal microbiota outcompetes them. So again, just to point out some of the different um, components um, that create barriers um, and inhibit the growth of um, pathogens. So looking at innate cells, and as you know, for even non-innate cells, they're going to have surface markers. But the really important distinction of the surface marker of some of the surface markers on innate cells is that they allow them to distinguish the difference between self, non-self, and altered self. So, um, you know, you have markers on you that indicate you are you. We would call those HLAs or MHCs. And then foreign cells, cells that aren't you, don't have those markers or the same markers. And so really what your innate cells are doing are picking up on those differences. Um, do you have, does this cell have the marker of you? No, does it have patterns that are not you? And so this is where pattern recognition receptors or PRRs um, are able to determine whether there's these repeat patterns, these molecular patterns that are found in pathogens or microbes, okay, or altered self. So these patterns on pathogens or microbes are known as PAMPs or MAMPs. So you'll see in a lot of the textbooks, the newer ones actually use the word MAMP, microbe associated molecular pattern. That's because there are plant associated molecular patterns and the botanist got mad. <laughs> I don't know how mad they actually got, but I imagine, imagine these like, you know, arguments of, but no, that's our term. So um, 
kind of in immunology and microbiology, what we said is, okay, you can have PAMPs, we'll, we'll take MAMPs instead. So, um, and it also gives you an idea that it's not just, these molecular patterns aren't just on pathogens, they're on microbes. And so your immune system's doing a, a check of your normal microbiota also to make sure that it's quote unquote safe, right? DAMPs are damage-associated molecular patterns, and so damage-associated molecular patterns, we would see these on what we call altered self. Altered self is, you know, a cell that has aged, dying, or has been damaged because of some kind of exposure um, or some kind of infection in there. So, you know, if, if you think about like a paper cut, um, you have damaged cells in there, and they'll start to express DAMPs in your immune cells, your innate cells, can bind those DAMPs through their pattern recognition receptors so that they know to eliminate those. Natural killer cells are really good at recognizing altered self, um, and whether that's altered self because of viral infection or it's damaged. So again, natural killer cells play an important role in kind of clearing out, um, you know, dead damaged cells. And again, you can see here in the figure how we have this a macrophage and it's got those pattern recognition receptors on its surface binding to the bacteria which is expressing non-self molecules and so then that macrophage engulfs it through the process of phagocytosis which we'll talk about later and then um, digests it and um, kills the bacteria so again it's all based on is this me or is it not me self versus non-self so this slide just gives you a basically a text of what I just chatted through. Again, some important terms are in bold, um, pathogen associated molecular patterns or microbe associated molecular patterns. So PAMPs, MAMPs, you should be familiar. This is not a botany class. So if I put PAMPs on, I mean pathogens. And then DAMPs, damage associated molecular patterns. And then we also have the pattern recognition receptors. There's a number of different pattern recognition receptor families um, and within those families, um, different pattern recognition receptors. So some of the receptors that you might see like on a macrophage um, are classified as scavenger receptors, which are abbreviated SR. They're able to detect different types of pathogens, so different molecular patterns. And as you can see with scavenge receptors, when they bind to their, their ligand, they signal for phagocytosis. And again, we'll talk about phagocytosis later, but it's engulfing of the pathogen of the bacteria of the microbe. And you can see the different ligands. So you can see LPS is a common ligand for these receptors. And that's because LPS is very unique to bacteria, especially it's found on gram negative bacteria and gram negative bacteria tend to be more on the pathogenic side. So gram positive bacteria tend to be more beneficial, not all the, always the case, there's pathogens among there, but again, being able to detect LPS is really important, um, you know, for, so we don't get infections. There are other receptors like complement receptors, so keep that in mind when we talk about complement later on, we'll talk briefly about receptors and how they can recognize some of these complement components. Um, so it's important, this is a way for your macrophage to recognize whether complement um, is being activated. So they have receptors to sense that. Um, and again, that can uh, lead to phagocytosis. And then there's the toll-like receptors. And that's what we'll spend most of our time talking about. Our journal club paper looks at toll-like receptors on macrophages. But for toll-like receptors, this is another family of receptors. So there's actually 10 different receptors and they bind all different types of um, MAMPs, <laughs> PAMPs. So they, um, everything from viral um, to bacterial to fungal components. Um, and so each of those receptors have specific ligands that they bind. And they actually induce signaling. Um, so they will cause gene expression changes. So they'll cause um, increased cytokine production that then can lead to phagocytosis or recruitment of other cells into the area. So again, um, these are some of the different families of pattern recognition receptors. We'll focus on toll-like receptors, and I will also talk about nod-like receptors, but just be aware that there are other ones. Um, toll-like receptors are the ones that 
probably have been studied the most out of all the pattern recognition receptors. Um, and that's because um, they have high homology with fruit flies. So Drosophila was a common model <laughs> to look at um, both on genetic standpoints and pheno effects of phenotypes, but also in um, early immunology studies. And so again, toll-like receptors have been widely studied um, and they are found in humans and other mammals too. Um, again, the other ones, depending upon obviously the research lab and their interests, they, might, they are investigated, but just not as widely. And so we'll tend to focus on the ones that are more common. And again, keep in mind that the, with these pattern recognition receptors, um, we can get different singling pathways activated, and that can contribute to the innate and inflammatory response. And really what we're talking about is production of cytokines. So here's the basic structure of a toll-like receptor. So it is going to form a dimer. So you'll notice that there's two chains. Um, you'll notice that it has a leucine rich repeat. So that hook portion has a high number of leucine in it. Um, and so again, those are called a leucine rich domain. Um, here it's being called a pathogen recognition domain, but the pathogen rec uh, recognition domain is made up of leucine rich repeats and so just be aware that those both those terms are used as far as talking about um, the toll-like receptor in the portion that binds to the pathogen. Um, they also have a TIR domain that is really important for cell signaling events. Um, so if you look at cell signaling pathways looking at toll-like receptors and um, downstream activation when ligand binds to them you'll notice that the TLR domain is involved in that and can bind to other singling proteins. Um, those can get phosphorylated and then lead to translocation of different transcription factors into the nucleus and then lead to gene expression changes. Um, I personally am not a huge fan of you guys memorizing uh, different pathways, cell singling pathways, because um, there are many different ones. In some of the journal club papers, they will look at cell signaling pathways. So if that, if that comes up in a journal club paper, then that's important for you to understand. So again, keep in mind that there's different toll-like receptors, so they can bind to different molecules inside and outside. So it's important to understand that toll-like receptors are found both on the cell surface, but they also can be found inside the cell in the endosome. So the endosome is a structure that's formed um, when phagocytosis occurs, uh, and so toll-like receptors can bind to that material that has been digested from the pathogen or from like a virally infected cell. Um, also, if the materials, you know, around the cell in, um, you know, the extracellular fluid, the toll-like receptors can bind. And again, you'll notice that each of these toll-like receptors are dimers. Some of them are homodimers, so both chains are made up of the same uh, molecule. So you'll see TLR4 is a homodimer. TLR3 is a homodimer. But then TLR1 and 2 are a heterodimer. So again, TLRs can, are dimers. They can be homodimers or heterodimers. And you can see that here in this table, looking at some of the different um, dimers of TLRs. And again, you can notice that some of these are heterodimers and then some of these are homodimers. And then notice the different ligands that they bind. In our journal club paper, we'll look specifically at some of these different um, TLRs because in the paper, they actually look at feeding macrophages different ligands and to see whether they get activated. Um, and if they become activated, that indicates that they have that TLR and the activation is through that TLR to get the response. I just want to point out some of these. Um, so Fagellin is a protein that's found on flagellated um, microbes, so bacteria. And so um, TLR5, which is a homodimer, can bind to that. We'll be looking at TLR9. So TLR9, um, it binds CPG. Um, DNA, so these unmethylated CPG 
um, portions of DNA, it's able to bind that and recognize it. And that can come either from viruses or from, from DNA viruses or bacteria. And you'll notice that those are found in the endosome, so they're inside the cell, where TLR5 is on the surface on the plasma membrane. Another one that's commonly looked at is TLR4. So we'll actually have a couple journal club, club papers that will look at TLR4. So they'll add LPS, lipid polysaccharide. And again, as I mentioned, that comes from gram-negative bacteria. This is found on the plasma membrane. And so um, a common way to activate um, different innate cells is to feed them LPS because mo a lot of your innate cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, mast cells, the xenophils, they have TLR4s, which is a homodimer. So you'll notice that different TLRs are able to recognize different types of um, ligands. And so I, I thought this was, you know, interesting and worth, worth including in the presentation because uh, it might help you in organizing your thoughts on TLRs and making some generalizations on their different ligands. So again, you can see here how um, there are TLRs that recognize lipids or TLRs that recognize nucleic acid and protein. And so being able for an, an innate cell to be able to recognize those that range of different um, molecular patterns from a, from a um, pathogen is, is important, right? And so if they only relied upon recognizing one type of molecule, um, it's not gonna be very effective as far as an immune response. The other thing on the other side of this um, figure, on the right side, you'll notice that they're looking at what are the receptors that are found in the endosome, so internal, and what ones are on the surface. So again, you can see that it allows for the innate cell to be able to recognize whether it's been engulfed or whether it hasn't been engulfed and it's on the surface. So again, um, being able to have receptors in both locations are very important. And as I mentioned, TLR um, binding pathways can activate cell signaling pathways. And so that um, your that domain, again, you're gonna have cell signaling events. And if we really kind of look downstream, a lot of times NF kappa B ends up getting activated, so it'll translocate into the nucleus and then cause gene expression changes. There's other pathways that can all um, that are also involved and also can be activated. So interferon regulatory factor, IRF pathway and MAP kinase pathways um, also can be activated too. And generally when we're looking at response, um, cytokines, chemokines, um, receptors, so we can change the expression level of receptors and also um, antimicrobial peptides usually are downstream um, effects of these cell signaling pathways. So here's the figure is just showing you recognition of LPS. Um, so we have this bacteria, it's gram negative bacteria, so it's LPS. Um, and so there's gonna be this LPS binding protein. Bacteria gets internalized into the macrophage. This leads to the LPS being loaded onto this receptor, which is known as CD14. And then it gets put onto the surface so it can interact with TLR4. So when that LPS binds to TLR4, that then causes these activation of intracellular um, signaling um, proteins. As you can see here, we get phosphorylation. You can see um, MyD88, so that's a common one that you'll probably see in one of our journal club papers where we can look at its activation, um, ERK, IKK, um, and then also, in, um, then you'll see NF kappa B, so NF kappa B there translocating into the nucleus and then causing gene expression change so that there can be a response. And the response here that we're seeing these little um, tan triangles are cytokines being produced. So kind of switching gears, um, looking at another um, pattern recognition receptor, there's the nod-like receptors or NL are 
So NLR can actually be utilized to create a structure called a complex called inflammasomes. So inflammasomes are uh, important in study because they end up generating um, IL-1 beta and IL-1 beta is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. They can also produce um, IL-18, but not as widely like looked at and studied. So when we have in, um, infections or um, injuries that end up leading to inflammation, um, IL-1 IL-1 beta is one that's looked at. And so when this complex forms, it is actually able to activate IL-1 beta. So you can see how IL-1 beta is actually in a pro form. But when we complex this nod-like receptor with additional proteins, including pro-caspase-1, that leads to the pro IL-1 beta being coming activated. So you can see how it becomes activated. So again, these structures are really cool. If you've taken cell bio, um, you might have heard about the apoposome. So this is very similar to the apoposome, but for the immune system, <laughs> for the immune response. So with that activated IL-1 beta, it still needs to get out of the macrophage. So it's through pyotosis that the macrophage ends up releasing and secreting the IL-1 beta. So it ends up creating these pores on its surface through gastrodermin D. So you can see gastrodermin D there. Um, and that allows some escape of the IL-1 beta. But as the IL-1 beta increases, that's going to initiate the macrophage to go into a cell death. So this is similar to apoptosis, but really specialized apoptosis for macrophages. Um, and so again, pri pryotosis is that cytokine release in the way that it's being released is by the death of the macrophage. So very effective. Once the IL-1 beta has been released through pyotosis, it can then bind to other macrophages, other immune cells um, that have the receptor for IL-1 beta, and this can lead to further production of other cytokines. And so as you can see here in this figure, these other cytokines that are, are being produced create different responses, act on different immune cells. So for example, you can see CXCL8 is going to recruit neutrophils. CCL2 is going to recruit monocytes. IL-12 is going to recruit natural killer cells. And so again, there are, each of these cytokines have a different effect they all end up leading to this state of inflammation. So again, this all started with that inflammasome activating IL-1 beta and then IL-1 beta being released by that dying macrophage and then leading to additional cytokine production. And all that got initiated by the recognition of pattern recognition receptors. And so again, keep in mind with pattern rec recognition receptors, the signaling pathways that can be activated can, it's not just cytokines, right? Um, there's antimicrobial peptides that can be induced, even chemokines, um, and even other enzymes um, that can utilize them. So looking at the second line of response um, that is in included into innate, there are the cellular responses. And for those cellular responses, um, we can talk about phagocytosis and inflammation. So we're gonna talk about these as separate processes, but keep in mind um, for inflammation to occur, you really need phagocytosis to occur. And so they work together. So as I've mentioned before with phagocytosis, it is that engulfing of foreign material, pathogens, altered self and then digesting it so it's degraded and in that case that pathogen that damaged cell is killed now we want to keep in mind with phagocytosis it then leads to responses from the cell that's engulfing it can also lead to presentation of some of that material to adaptive cells and we'll look at that um, later on in the semester but here in this figure, you can see how we have mannose receptor. Mannose receptor is acting as our pattern recognition receptor. It recognizes mannose on the surface of the bacteria. So the mannose would be our MAMP or our PAMP. So when that binds, that ends up leading to endocytosis. So you can see how we have the bacteria being bound by that receptor. And you can see how that 
membrane is coming in to create a vesicle around that material. That vesicle is called an endosome. If you're using other textbooks, you might see it's called a phagosome. So pathogen enclo enclosed endosome, it's enclosed through endocytosis. So it's whatever has been on the outside of the cells now been brought in. You'll notice here we have our lysosome down there at the bottom. The lysosome is going to contain digestive enzymes. So enzymes that can break down proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, all the stuff that this bacteria is made up of. Um, and so that then will end up fusing with the endosome to create the phagolysosome. So here you can see in the phagolysosome that bacteria is completely digested. That digested material can then either be released through exocytosis. In the process of being released through exocytosis, um, it can be loaded onto MHC class 2 and then presented to adaptive cells. So this figure is looking at macrophages being the phagocyte, the cell undergoing phagocytosis. But other cells can also undergo phagocytosis. So here we see a neutrophil. So you can see how the bacteria is binding to these receptors. Um, so pattern recognition receptors, it's being brought into the cell, um, being put into an endosome, and then we're gonna get fusion with different um, enzymes. And those enzymes are gonna be able to break down and again, that would be in our phagosome, really our phagolysosome. One of the hallmarks of the phagolysosome is that we end up getting this drop in pH, and that drop in pH activates a lot of these, a number of these enzymes. Here we see the neutrophil ends up dying. <laughs> and so, because it's engulfed that material, and so then it can be taken up by a macrophage. So macrophages tend to be better androgen presenting cells, so by doing this, this will allow the macrophage to then present to um, adaptive cells. So again, just some of the terminology. Um, again, some of the textbooks you might see phagosome instead of endosome, but they're really the same structure. Um, that phagosome is going to fuse with the lysosome. The lysosome is where we have the digestive enzymes that's going to end up degrading um, the material that's in that vesicle, that fused vesicle. Um, and when they fuse, that would be called a phagolysosome. So one of the things that neutrophils do to increase the probability of being able to interact with bacteria and viruses so that they can undergo phagocytosis with them is they actually create these neutrophil extracellular traps or nets. Um, great abbreviation, right? So they actually almost create like these nets. Um, you can find that these nets occur when there is um, like clotting events also. So these nets, just as the name entails, actually catch the bacteria and viruses on them. So you can see here in this image how we have the bacteria caught on the net. Um, then this allows for the neutrophil to be able to interact with the bacteria, engulf it, digest it. And then the neutrophil is going to end up dying. And when this is occurring on nets, this is known as nettosis. So again, think of apoptosis, but that's just unique to neutrophils. Um, and unique to neutrophils when they're um, entrapped with the bacteria in these nets, in these neutrophil extracellular traps. This death of the neutrophil then would allow for macrophages to then take them up. So next we're going to look at inflammation. So when we have an inflammatory response, this is usually marked by pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. Um, and these cytokines and chemokines are going to be able to activate innate cells, um, also tell innate cells to come to this location. So it recruits in innate cells to help in clearing the infection or the presence of pathogens. So some of the early events that happen with inflammation is going to be increased vascular permeability. I believe we talked about in class how really the initial is vasoconstriction. You stop blood flow, but then there becomes this permeability that happens once um, inflammation is activated. Then you'll see a recruitment of neutrophils and other leukocytes, so other white blood cells. And this does include adaptive cells also. 
And also keep in mind that depending upon where this site is, there might be resident um, immune cells present, both innate and adaptive. So um, your textbook doesn't have a great image, so I included this one in. So, um, so keep in mind, um, there are there is some some images that are somewhat similar but i i like this one better <laughs> so here you can see there's some kind of tissue damage and that with that damage um, there's going to be altered cells there's going to be cells that are producing damps damage associated molecular patterns but we could also introduce pathogens bacteria into that site and so initially some of those residents are going to try to deal with that um, you can get mast cells becoming activated and releasing histamine. So you're going to get the release of different um, chemical attractants, cytokines, chemokines. And with histamine release, one of the hallmarks of histamine release is that you get vasodilation. So the blood vessels are going to expand. Um, this allows for increased blood flow, which would be, would be ind indicative of redness of the area because there's increased blood flow increased red blood cells but with that increased blood flow you end up end up having additional immune cells coming to the location because there's going to be immune cells in circulation the immune cells are using these chemical trails as an indication of where they need to then attach to those endothelial cells and then squeeze in to that area where there's the damage um, damage and potential pathogens present. We'll talk a little bit more about that process in just a moment with some details. Um, but then what happens, you can see how this um, neutrophil is squeezing in there. So additional neutrophils and phagocytes are going to be called into the area so they can start to undergo phagocytosis. So they're going to engulf that material and destroy the bacteria. Okay, And they've used chemotaxis in order to sense where they need to go. Once the pathogen and damaged tissue is removed, then the repair process can occur. So you can have mitosis of the normal cells of that tissue to repopulate any of that damaged area. Um, and I do to just, just to know some of these immune cells stay behind and they become residents of this. So in case there's damage again in the future or there's pathogens that aren't resolved, they're present there. So looking at this, how does the immune cell get in? Um, so what happens, again, they're using chemotaxis. They're tr t um, looking at this chemical signal. So we have this chemokine here, CXCLL8. So it's going to have a receptor to it. And so when it starts to sense there's more of it, they start to produce um, molecules that are going to allow them to attach. Um, so they'll pr produce um, integrins. And those integrins can bind to selectins. And then you also see LFA being produced on the neutrophil. And that can bind to ICAM. So that then kind of anchors and tightly binds the neutrophil to the endothelial cell. So then it can squeeze through through a process known as diapoiesis. And with diapoiesis, again, they're squeezing through those endothelial cells. And because there's been vasodilation, the space between those endothelial cells are slightly separated. So again, the last figure kind of showed this a little better. Neutrophil squeezes through, and then it makes a migration to the location where the pathogen is. Now, I like this terminology better than extravasation. So extravasation is a term that's used for cancer cells. So um, this is one of those like, you know, <laughs> things that sometimes people get hung up on and it's one of the things I do. Um, so just be aware that some textbooks use um, these kind of cancer terms talking with immune cells. I don't personally like it because I like them, those terms to be reserved for cancer cells. So I like diapoiesis in um, migration um, for terms as talking about and how these neutrophils end up into the affected um, tissue. Now, if we have systemic, so that's really how we deal with like localized inflammation, but if we have systemic inflammation, there are certain cytokines that can indicate um, and contribute to inflammatory response. 
So again, keep in mind if we were to take like a blood sample from a patient that has chronic or systemic inflammation, we might see increases in IL-1 beta. You guys know about that right now. Um, IL-6 and TNF-alpha. These can act on two different organs like liver, bone marrow, hypothalamus, fat, and muscle. And they can then lead to responses to assist in that inflammation. So whatever is driving the inflammation in order to clear it. So with the liver, you'll get production of acute phase um, proteins like CRP and MLB. So CRP is um, C-reactive protein. So this is a marker that's commonly looked at to indicate whether someone's in like systemic inflammation. Um, MLB is mannose binding lectin. So this would be indication that you're trying to activate and having um, complement pathway involvement. For the bone marrow, this is where neutrophils, which normally reside in the bone marrow, will actually be mobilized and sent out so that they can undergo phagocytosis. Hypothalamus is going to cause an increase in body temperature, like fever, right? Because that actually decreases um, the virus or bacteria's ability to survive because you've moved it out of its normal um, temperature range. And then with fat and muscle, this can um, have metabolic increases. So again, with if you have later stage inflammation, this is where acute phase response is going to be indicated. And clinically, you can look at pro-inflammatory cytokines and also markers like CRP, C-reactive protein, to indicate that. Um, So this figure from the textbook shows some of these different acute phase proteins and what their function is, and then also looking at um, over time how their, um, produ their production level changes. So looking at some of the other cells involved um, with an innate response, we have the innate lymphoid cells. So remember these were derived from the common um, lymphoid progenitor. So unlike the other, com the other innate cells that are derived from the common myeloid progenitor, these ones come from the lymphoid progenitor but have innate characteristics. So they very much work by self, non-self, self, altered self, right? So um, they work and they very innate like they are, um, their response is going to be the same each time. So there classically is the natural killer cells. That's one most people know about. And then there is actually six other populations of innate lymphoid cells. And each of these have different functions. Um, table from your textbook outlines these different um, innate lymphoid cells. Um, again, natural killer cells. And then we have these um, subcategories of um, ILC1, 2, and 3. And again, you'll notice if you look over at the cellular response, they contribute to different types of immunity, like type 1 immunity, type 2, and type 3. Um, so again, just, you know, be aware of them. <laughs> Generally, if we have conversations about them, it's going to be about the natural killer cells because those are the ones that um, we have a better understanding about. So natural killer cells um, are, again, have though they've come from the common lymphoid progenitor and actually have some of the lymphoid markers, um, they have innate immune functions, okay? So they're able at being able to recognize um, self proteins that get induced by infections, malignant um, transformations, so tumors and other stressors. So again, they are known for that altered self. So molecules that normally aren't normally on the surface that move to the surface, natural killer cells are good at recognizing. And the way they um, perform their function is they can release porphyrin and gramzyme, and these induce apoptosis of the target cell. So that altered self is um, little holes get punched on the surface, and that leads the cell to go into apoptosis. They can also produce cytokines, and those cytokines can induce adaptive responses. So here we can see how this nat with the natural killer cell, we're going to have the productions of cytokines. That leads 
to the natural killer cells going and finding these infected cells, um, or if this was, you know, this this could be looked at for altered self, um, they get induced. But then you can see then they're after the natural killer cells kill the infected cells, we then are activating T cells to come in and do additional clearing if needed. All right, so with that, if there's any you know questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Hopefully you have found this useful and don't forget that there is a second audio lecture for this unit on complement. So this gives you a good background of the first line of defense and second line of defense with innate, some of the different cells that are involved and the processes that they're involved with.